And this is 12 10 2014. And the message is powerfully engaged. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and, what's that word? Active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. First question, where's the heart? It's inside of you, right? Yes. Okay, so this is an, an internal perspective. The word of God is living and active. 16 years ago, this really impacted me. 16 years ago, the word, the, the word came to me by hearing, and that was an experience I had on my front porch with God. Nobody told me about Jesus. It was simply God telling me uh, a revelation of sorts. There is a God. You're not him. And if there is a God, you need to figure out who he is and what pleases him. Amen. That started me in the right direction. So what did I do? I did what most believers do, or those who are seeking truth, they go to church. That landed me in a precious Baptist church for three years. After about three years, something happened. I actually opened the word. I actually stopped listening just to the pastor and actually started reading the word. Okay, this is actually where my experience starts. Why? Because this word we're talking about tonight is about engagement. And what happened when I opened that word was I started to engage the word. I started to put the word in me, started to let it divide soul and spirit, let it get down deep inside of me. And that caused a direction like no other. I actually, after three years of sitting in a dead place that I thought was alive, realized that something that I was reading in a book that I thought was just a book and some other man's thought was actually living and active. Not only was it living and active, he showed me that it was living and active in me. Well, that really caused me a problem. That means I had to change. That, it took me to a place where I had to take an inspection of where I was. Was I just listening to a pastor and a preacher that was sitting in front of me that I saw as a a precious, sweet man of God and everything that came from his mouth was truth? Or did I go to the word and rightly divide it and see what was coming and landing in my ears and saturating to my soul was actually true for me? Tonight, I want to talk to you about engagement, engaging in the word. Now, when the Lord brought me to this particular scripture and I thought about the word engagement, my mind originally went to engagement like marriage, right? Not only because that's just what came to my mind, but also because we recently saw a very powerful engagement. We saw a very powerful engagement when we saw a man of God and a woman of God take a step towards a greater glory in their relationship. Talking about Curtis and Mary. Curtis, let me ask you something. When that moment in time came and you asked that question and you engaged Mary, did she engage you back? Okay, well then an engagement is actually dependent upon two, am I right? It's a codependent event. An engagement is a codependent event. So I want to talk to you tonight about a couple different engagements because each one of us in here is sitting and thinking a different thought of what engagement is. Maybe they're all in the same. Maybe they're different, but let the word determine that for us, amen? Amen. So for me, if we're engaged in marriage, To me, I'm engaged to another. That's what I think about when I think of a marriage engagement. 
In 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Can you turn there, please? In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, it says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. How can a man that is not Jesus Christ, the word of the word of God made flesh standing on the planet, say that I am jealous for you, for another, on behalf of God? Is that a little brash? To me, it's not because I know the nature of God and to him, it's not. It's the word of God from his mouth. How? Because in Exodus 34, 14, it says God is a jealous God. And if God is a jealous God, now Paul has taken on the very attribute and nature of God. And so he speaks on behalf of him. He has been married to Christ. He has been married to God. And now he's speaking to you about his experience. So it's not that he's telling some other man's story. He's telling about his marriage engagement with God. Amen. He's telling about the time that he stopped listening to others tell the word of God and actually started to engage it him on his own self. And what happened next was that God actually imparted to him his own very character and nature, and it changed him. Engagement in marriage is actually engagement to a marriage, to a covenant relationship with your God. You know what this told me? It was okay to be jealous. When I started to liken the word of God, the relationship with God to a, to a marriage, I started to look into my marriage. I started to realize that if God was jealous for me and if God was jealous for his people, then it was okay for me to be jealous over my family and what God was doing in it. So you see these things like jealousy and anger, and we think these are vices, but submit it to God, they become virtues. Amen. They become things that actually benefit. It's just that they have to be in check to the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's okay to be angry about wickedness that's coming against your family. Yes. It's okay to be jealous about your family in the midst of darkness and not letting everybody else give their opinion of the watered down word and perspective into your life. God's called you. God's equipped you. And if you're engaged in the word, he's made you the rightful judge of that situation. Luke 14, 28 talks about accounting of the cost. Luke 14, 28 says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost? to see if he has enough money to complete it. For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, anyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still long off and will ask for a term of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up any, everything he has cannot be my disciple. It's a marriage relationship. It's a marriage relationship. It's a covenant that has no quit in it. Amen. It's a covenant that has no quit. When two join in the... In the company of God, there is no quit. The reason we get engaged and put ourselves in position to be married, to, make, to come to that day, is because once we cross that threshold, whatever may come does not matter. That covenant relationship has determined the fact that there is no quit. It puts you in a position in order to... The, when the uh, war comes against you, that you're, you're not able to bounce out. You actually have to step up and step into that war and watch God work through you. Amen. God is jealous for you. When I see a character and an attribute of God, I have to ask myself, I know that I'm not God, but I know that I serve God. I know that he's my father and that makes me his son. 
And I know by engaging the word that I, the father is supposed to look like, that the son is supposed to look like the father. And so I ask myself, God is jealous for me. Am I jealous for him? Am I jealous for him? When I look into somebody else's life, am I competing with the glory of God in their life? Or am I jealous to see the glory of God be made known in their life? When I see my brothers and my sisters moving forward in the faith, do I, uh, do I want to covet what God's doing in them? Or do I want to step back and say, let me do whatever I can to die that you may live. Let me do whatever I can to prop you up and to propel you in the right direction to help you do what God is already doing in you. Whatever I can do, am I? You see, because if the word is living and active, it's active in me. It's dividing my thoughts from God's thoughts. It's dividing my motives from God's motives. Is it possible that the word of God is living and active in you and has his own mind, his own agenda in things? Absolutely. An engagement in marriage is actually engagement to marriage. What about another type of engagement? What about engagement in discipleship? This church, this body as a whole is a discipleship ministry. If you didn't know that, something's wrong. <laughs> discipleship. When I think of engaging in discipleship, I think of two disciples on one ship. I think of two men, two disciplined men of God, two disciplined women of God joining arms on one ship in one direction. And whether the storms come and tries to blow the ship over, we got each other. And on that ship, it might get crazy sometimes. We might sharpen each other. Wow. And make the word true. We might love each other. We might feed each other. We might clean the boat together, all these kinds of things. But we're on one ship because we're married to God and now we're married to each other. And we're in one partnership for one goal. This is a ne next step in the unification of the glory of God. Jeremiah 21.8. Jeremiah 21, 8 says, furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you a way of life and a way of death. Engagement in discipleship to me is engaged by discipleship. You are now engaged by a way of life. You have taken on a way of life. And when you engage with another on that very ship, I picture me, a younger man walking in the faith, engaged in a relationship with an older man walking in the faith. And he is imparting to me a way of life that I am looking forward to, that I see in the word because I've engaged the word. And now I notice that he's gone before me and I actually don't have to go through some of these hardships that might uh, become because of sin. And therefore, I can actually do twice as much as he does one day. That's the goal. Amen. That's the goal. You're on one ship. And when that ship lands, you're to take off running, propelled in the right direction. I am setting before you the way of life. We take on the way of life that Jesus walked. And as we come, as we walk throughout this life and we and we come into contact with other men and women of God, are we engaging in discipleship? Are we engaging into what, what we know that we see in the word? Are we be, being written in the book of Acts? I want to be in the chapters of the book of Acts. Amen. I want to be that. It's a desire and a burden of, of mine. In the first years that I engaged the word, I opened to the book of Acts. And I went, I have to have this and no other. The rest of the days of my life, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to be written in this book. The way of life. Here's what happens when you're trying to be engaged in discipleship. 
or maybe you even are, you recognize when God puts somebody in your life. You recognize it. But we never pull the trigger. Some of us do and some of us don't. And you can tell the difference in between the ones that do and the ones that don't. Engaged in discipleship. You know what happens when you're engaged in discipleship? You start to see the rights and the wrongs. And you know what happens? Some things come alive in you. The word actually makes itself known as alive in you, like Hebrew says. It, <laughs> it's, it's, it is designed to do that. As you walk in experience, the word becomes more and more true to you. And so when you're walking in discipleship and you see the one that's gone before you get it wrong and it's blatant or you, you might see you might disagree with another and say, well, I wouldn't do that. But why is he doing that? Right. It, and you might have two different. Um, what's the word? Um, convictions. But does that mean that you have taken on that man's conviction? Not necessarily. It depends on what's in the word and what the word is making alive to you. All right. So when you see that happening, what rises up in you and what's what's risen up in me is that I can either be critical. I can point that thing out. Or I realize that God works through that man despite his downfalls. And you know what that does for me in turn? It makes me believe I can. Amen. Because my downfalls and my brokenness is evident to me. I see it when nobody does. I hide it better than anybody. But when I see the one that's gone before me fall and then fall on his face and then get up and walk even taller than before, I realize that God's in him. God's for him, despite him. And therefore, what does that mean for me? God's in me and for me, despite me. And it, you know what it does? It creates a desire of love. And that's supernatural because I can't create my own desire. It makes a desire in me that comes from the heavens and all of, all of a sudden something's impart, parted in me because I engaged in discipleship. You know what that took? It took risk. It opens up my life. It opens up my life and says, here I am, right and wrong. Totally transparent to you. Teach me. Help me. Amen. Help me. I know. But you know what happens? Pride comes. Pride comes and, and the person says, uh, no, I only follow Jesus. I can't follow men and all these other things. And I'll be the first one to tell you we always follow Jesus. And a true prophet's always going to point you to Jesus. But you, don't, you take an outside perspective and say that. I'm talking from an inside perspective. And the inside perspective is when you walk in discipleship, that man or that woman is going to always lift you up, help you and point you back to the father. Amen. That's being engaged by a way of life. When you're asking somebody else to come in, your way of life is giving greater glory to God than mine. Please come in and impart that to me. You are being engaged by discipleship. Jeremiah 30, 21 in 2 Peter, he talks about taking on the divine nature. In Jeremiah 30, 21. Can you put that in the King James Version, the powerful King James Version? <laughs> ah, yes. Look at this. For who is this? That, had, that engaged his heart to approach unto me, says God. What is happening? The verse in general, for all you students in here, a word that I'm uh, cherry picking scripture, is a prophecy of Jesus from, uh, from Jeremiah. And it's talking about Jesus coming near to the Father. And the father actually accepting him. But what happened for the acceptance to come was this man engaged his heart, approached God, and then God engaged him. And this is what happens when you engage the word. You engage the word and something supernatural happens. The word actually engages you, changes you, molds you, inspires you, makes you into something that you are not.
You know why discipleship engagement has been so prevalent to my life? Is because when I, when I can see another man of God getting it right and getting it wrong, it annihilates all the I can'ts in me. Every time I say I can't, the Spirit says I can. Amen. Every time that I say I can't, the Spirit says I can and you know it. And then it's no, no more, it's no longer an adequacy issue. It's an obedience issue. And when I narrow it down to an obedience issue, then I got to narrow it down to whether I'm going to stand in rebellion or do what God told me to do at first. And that's simply obey him because he's my father. And then I go backtrack and I go, how can I obey you, God? And he says, I'm your father. And just that name alone should make you trust me. I'm like, amen. Well, let's do it. And then he empowers me, equips me, encourages me, and propels me forward. Amen? A third type of engagement. Engagement in warfare. Boy, do we talk about that a lot around here. And any body of believers that you fellowship with, it should be the conversation. Because we are in warfare. We don't like to say it, but we sure better engage it. (laughs) Engage in warfare for me is engage for warfare. You see, when I engaged in warfare, when I engaged in the word, I realized that I that the war was already brought to me. So if the war was already brought to me, I had no choice. I had no choice. I was born again for this. So I'm not engaged in warfare. I'm engaged for warfare. When I engage the word, God equips me, makes his word alive in me and puts me right in the middle of warfare. And all around me is chaos. And all of a sudden, chaos starts to look like opportunities. I start to ask, I start to take my eyes off of circumstances and say, why, oh God, why, oh God, why, oh God? It's not why, oh God. It's why, why am I not doing something about it? You see, because he places me right in the middle and he makes, the scripture tells me, I am the peacemaker. I am the one that makes right order with man and in God, with God in the midst of chaos. And when I, when I get a grip of that and understand that that is my life and will be to the end of my days, I start to take joy in it. I start to take joy in the fact that I was born again for this, that I was born again for this, that God is equipping me for this, and that if I do not enter the fight, I will not ever realize the fight that is in me. I heard a Michael Brown quote today, and he said, the Goliath, every man needs a Goliath in order to bring the David out of him. Bring on the Goliath, bring on the giants, because I want to know what it is to hear the sounds of giants falling. But how can I if I do not engage in warfare? Because to engage in warfare is to engage, be engaged for warfare. Judges chapter three and verse two. Boy, I found a sweet nugget. Go back to one and then two. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the war in Canaan. He did this, God, only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israel, Israelites who had not previously uh, had previous battle experience. Well, man, that brings joy for me. That tells me that somewhere in history, and that means for my history, that God in himself finds it wisdom to leave enemies in my land. Why? because he wants me to engage them. And if I engage them, then I will see that it is he that is in me and can overcome these that are in front of me. But if I never engage warfare, I won't realize that scripture is alive and well, just like Hebrews 12 said, uh, 412. The word of God is living and active. How are we going to know it? We put ourselves in the middle of warfare and watch it come out. Watch it. Battle-tested, full-grown sons 
with wide shoulders of character. That's what God's after. Amen. That's what God's after. Amen. Because when you engage warfare, it builds character. And with character, you can carry the promise that's coming. But I'm going to tell you the truth. If you never build character, when the promise comes, it won't last. You can't carry it. You won't be strong enough. You won't be equipped and you won't be ready. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to pass up the promise to come? This is a narrow way we're on, correct? Yes. Each, way, each part of the narrow way, not spoken to us, but absolutely true. There's a promise along the way. God knows it. You don't. You believe it. But he knows at a point in time, there's a promise that you're going to pick up. But he seems to put years in between it sometimes. And those years are opportunities for you to build wider shoulders. So when the time comes, you pick up that promise and you can keep on moving forward. But if you step out of the fight, if you try to go around the narrow way, you'll never build the shoulders that are built to carry that promise to come. Amen. God wants you to become aware of his powerful presence and its location. You see, that was a difference for me. I realized that God was, that he is, that he is powerful. But then there came a revelation that he wanted to be powerful in me. That when I engaged the word, the word engaged me. I have to, I have to ask, where was that engagement taking place? It was taking place in me. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that, that it's sharper than double-edged sword, that it's piercing inside of me. It's a heart inspection. And, the, and when I inspect this heart, because I invited God in, I find the living and active word taking root in me and engaging me. Engaged in warfare means that you must get engage warfare because it's already engaged you. Amen? Amen. Engaged in the word. My fourth and last perspective on engagement. I've talked to you throughout this about engagement in the word. And that's really what I want you to get because that's my experience. When I engaged the word, it engaged me. But was that a true for experience? When I find an experience that happens to me, I go back to the word. And if it lines up with the word, then I, I call that an experience that God wanted me to have for him, through him, and to learn something from it. Isaiah 55, 10 tells us about this. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Now, this creates a problem for me, a conflict in my soul. That word of God, I know, is in me and in you. And it will return to God with, with, out. It will definitely return to God had accomplished what it was sent to do. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? You see, this is what happens when you engage the word. It must change you. How do we ask the word of God to come and live in us and then not do what the word of God says to do? Is that not rebellion? You see, if you will open up this word, it is living and active and it will change you. It will come down to a conflict of interest between your soul and the spirit of God. And it will be very simple for you. Obey or rebel. You see, God's not the God uh, of confusion. He makes this simple. He makes it very simple for you. The word is true. And my thoughts must line up with it. My thoughts. He says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways higher than your ways. And you invited that in your life. You invited that in your soul. So where do we line up? Do we, in, do we expect that we invite the living, active word to live in us? And then when we don't do it, 
walk in the favor of God? Do we expect to be happy or comfortable, whatever word you want to use? When you ask God to come and live in you and he's got a mind of his own, God's word is intentional. God's word is living and God's word is active. God's word has a mind of its own. But you know why? Because the word of God and God cannot be separated. The word of God, God, the spirit of God, they are one source. They cannot be separated. And they live in you. Amen. What does that mean? There's somebody living in here. And he, is, he has got an intention like no other. He's got a mind of his own and sometimes he frustrates me. <laughs> sometimes he makes me happy. You know, it, it depends on me lining up with what he wants to do in me. Amen. You are the house of God, correct? Yes. All right. Then you have now moved over and somebody else lives in this house. We call him master in God. And when we wake up each day, we ask him, God, master, what are we going to do in this house today? What should we say? What should we feel? Where should we go? Right? Yes. Okay, we're on the same page. <laughs> because that intentional word that lives in you is going to return back to him. Had producing fruit. Will you go with him? Yes. <laughs> then let's go back to Hebrews 4.12. And I want to bring this scripture alive to you. Now, the reason that I've brought you through these couple of scriptures, because I really wanted you just to get Hebrews 4.12, because this scripture is alive, not just the words within it, but it's come alive to me. It means something to me that it may not mean to you. And I would hope that by my experience, suffering, hardship, whatever I may have had to go through in order to understand this word, that I might be able to give it to you so that you could enjoy the glory of God in it as well. Amen. Amen. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of my heart. That I have, I have fallen in love with. Have you? Yes. Have you fallen in love with God uh, taking his sword and wrenching your soul? When, he, when, he, when it penetrates your very heart, what it usually feels like is a truth saying, this is light and this is darkness. Choose one. And when you choose the light, then comes life. But if you teeter in between or if you go over to darkness, it's death. This day I've set before you a way of life. Please walk in it. It's what he's asking you to do. I'm your father and I have paved a beautiful way for you. It's a way of life and it will bring you abundant life. It will bring you abundant life in me. You will know me. You will know that I am your reward and no other. But like pastor said the other day, we're the sole creation that has the audacity to do something other. Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is living and active. If we're talking about engagement, because I'm a man, and I love explosions, I love the powerful word of God. Some of you might think engagement, and you might think marriage. Others might think engagement, and you're thinking of assault rifle. Honestly, sometimes they're hard to distinguish. <laughs> but let me tell you why. This, Cody, correct me if I'm wrong, is an AK AR-15. How much I know? It's because I've engaged in marriage, not so much in warfare. That's right. Powerfully engaged. Let me explain to you a powerful engagement that happens with this. This is an assault rifle, much like many of us in the kingdom. This destroys enemies. 
Now this is an empty assault rifle, which does no good unless I poke the enemy in the eye. And at that, everybody sighed a sigh of relief. This helps me to hit my target. <laughs> I like it. Now, the one problem with this assault weapon is no ammo in it. When you engage the word of God, you load this weapon. Amen. Just you load yourself. Amen. Jeremiah said is a fire shut up in my bones. When I engage this weapon, I am now in position to destroy the enemy. Just like when you engage the word. When you engage the word, we're talking about a positioning. You are now positioned to be an assault weapon for the kingdom of God. This is God's intention for you. If you're an assault weapon and you're loaded, engaged, what's the next step? You got to pull the trigger. Have you pulled the trigger? Has God spoken something to you? Have you put the word of God in you? Are you engaged? Are you engaged in warfare? Are you engaged in the word? Are you positioned to hit your target? If I'm aimed in the right direction, and this is what discipleship does, aims you in the right direction, and I'm loaded with a fire shut up in my bones, it is my job to pull the trigger. And when I pull that trigger, something happens. That ammo that's in this gun hits the target and destroys it. That's propelling in the right direction. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Well, then when the word, when you engage the word and put it in you and you step out to share that word and preach that word, that ammo goes from you to another. That's God's intention. God's intention is that you engage the word, Amen. that he loads you with fire shut up in your bones and that you pull the trigger so that you can destroy the enemy and be effective for someone else. Are you engaged in the word? Are you just reading the word? Are you listening to just men from a pulpit? God wants to give you revelation. He wants to give you understanding. Better yet, he wants to give you experience so that you know that the word of God is living and active and powerful in you. Amen? Amen. I'm going to leave it at that. When I point this weapon to you, does it make you tense? Because you're on the other end of it, right? Yeah. Well, then what should you expect if you're pointed in the right direction, if the enemy is before you and you're about to release the word of God? Yeah. Expect tension. It's part of your life. But you know what comes next? Destruction of the enemy. Amen. 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 About time we hear the sounds of giants falling in this place. Amen. Let the Lord propel you in the right direction. Release that which he put in you. Amen. Amen.